Worship continues with confession and forgiveness found on page two of your bulletin. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the tender mercy of our God. God, for whom we wait, in the presence of one another, we confess our sin before you. We fail in believing that your good news is for us. We falter in our call to tend your creation. We find our sense of self in material wealth. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget that we are your children and turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one, and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Christ Jesus has looked with favor upon you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. You are the children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise and recipients of divine mercy. God strengthens you anew to follow the way of peace. Amen. You may be seated. mention thanks to our quartet as well for um, filling in this morning. We got a really special music coming at the postlude, so uh, please stay seated in, at the end. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together the prayer found on page three of your bulletin. Stir up the wills of faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the preaching of John that rejoicing in your salvation, we may bring forth the fruits of repentance through Jesus Christ, amen.
The first reading for today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 1 through 7. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your son shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover your land, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered to you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister to you. They shall be acceptable on my altar, and I will glorify my glorious house. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Today's second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand as you're able for the gospel. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel for the third Sunday of Advent, according to Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. It is perhaps a bit 
out of character to use a gospel text for Advent in this kind of fashion, one in which Jesus is clearly already here. But I think this gospel text is helpful because it gives us a summary of sorts of the core gospel mission of who Jesus was and why Jesus came. He speaks himself through the words of Isaiah of the mission God has given him in earth. And our two previous readings, Isaiah and 2 Corinthians, both talk about light, the light of Christ coming upon us, the light of the gospel. And in this Advent season, one in which we mark time by the increasing light around an Advent wreath, I wanted to spend some time with you this morning, reflecting on the light of the knowledge of Christ that Paul references in 2 Corinthians and the ways that we, as followers of Jesus, bear that light for one another. And I wanted to use what are commonly known as Advent themes for our exploration. So this morning we will reflect together on peace, love, joy, and my personal favorite, hope. I want to spend just a few minutes reflecting on each of the themes as we think about the light of Christ in this season and in our own lives. So I'm going to uh, intersperse some additional biblical readings as we reflect on these themes. And I'm going to invite you at various times to take a pause and to meditate on some of the concepts. So I hope you're ready. I want to offer with to you uh, the words of Philippians chapter four as we begin to reflect on our first theme, which will be peace for the purposes of this morning. And these are the words of Philippians chapter four. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I used that last verse, verse 7 of Philippians chapter 4, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I've used that verse in the past two years (laughs) more than I have in the whole duration of my life leading up to that point. Praying for peace to be upon us, the people of God in this place. And this morning I want you to reflect on the notion of peace for just a moment and to use this reading from Philippians in the context of the light of the gospel of Christ, I want to ask a couple of questions. Now, you can answer them reflectively in your own heart and mind. I won't make you share anything today. But I offer to you the following. What does peace look like for you? What is peace of God? When you close your eyes, and you can close them now if you're feeling brave, and consider the peace of God. How do you feel? Or when are there times that come quickly to mind of moments that you felt at peace or experienced the fullness of God's peace in your own life? In scripture, the Hebrew word shalom is often translated in our English version of scripture as peace, which is true, but shalom doesn't get fully, peace doesn't get fully at the full definition of shalom. Shalom is not just the absence of conflict or of war, but rather a sense of wholeness and a fullness, a certainty and a life and contentment. So I want you to consider where in your life in your family, your community, or in the world, do you wish for or pray for peace to be made known? Where do you long for others to experience the wholeness and fullness of community life of shalom? Or who do you know that might be longing for an encounter with the peace of God? What areas of your life do you need to be drenched in the peaceful presence of God. This morning, I invite you to take a moment to reflect and to pray for those who come to mind, or to pray for yourself, to offer before God the places you see a need for God's peace in the world even now.
a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus, the one who is yet to come. These same verses from Philippians are going to shape our reflection on joy. Rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians says. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. So do not worry about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Let's reflect together for a moment on the Advent theme of joy. We'll start our reflection with a few more questions and then a meditation. When in your life have you felt deep joy? Who were you with? Or what were you doing? What environment were you in? Outside, inside? <clears throat> Where have you experienced and when have you experienced deep joy? I will confess that of all four of the Advent themes, joy is the hardest for me, personally, because sometimes I feel like I should feel joy even when I don't. I have a friend who passed away several years ago. She embodied joy in my experience of her. At her funeral, actually, another friend spoke of how you couldn't know the color of her eyes because they were always shut in a smile. She was the type of person who, when they smiled, her eyes kind of squinted closed, and she was always smiling. And after her funeral, someone gave me a gift, a small plaque that sits on my desk. It has a bright yellow sun and the words, always choose joy, written across it. I try to choose joy, but sometimes it's hard. <laughs> Sometimes I'm overwhelmed by the sorrow of which affects my life or I witness in the lives of others. And I wonder what joy is supposed to look like then. I wonder about anticipatory joy, the fact that in Advent, much of our joy comes not from what we're currently experiencing, but from what we know is yet to come. Joy is, I think, intertwined with hope, a sense that even though the moment around us might be one of suffering or frustration, that there is something better yet to come. That is Advent joy. A sense that even in the most lovely of today's moments, there is a fullness of joy that comes in the Advent of Christ. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture that references joy is found in Psalm 51, when the psalmist prays, Restore in me the joy of your salvation. Psalm 51 reminds me that joy is not contingent or tied to outside circumstances, but that true Christian joy, deep, unfailing joy, is connected to the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. That Advent joy is about the realization, the confession and proclamation that Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, is coming yet again. Our salvation is our joy, and our salvation is in Christ. I meditate on that psalmist prayer a lot, particularly in seasons in which I feel less joyful. I remind myself that joy is indeed rooted in Christ, that our joy is rooted in God's gift of salvation, the very thing we prepare in Advent to celebrate, and that joy is not dependent on my present circumstances, but rather the steadfast truth of who Jesus is. But let's turn our attention to the third Advent theme. The one I'm using today for number three is love. And this is perhaps the theme that most of us are most familiar with, the one in which perhaps the most biblical scriptures come to mind right away. We could probably, if we were pressed, most of us recite some kind of Bible passage that used the word love. For God so loved the world in John chapter 3 might be a go-to. But also perhaps 1 Corinthians chapter 13, if it doesn't come directly in mind, you might be one of the rare people who did not have it spoken at your wedding. 
Or perhaps otherwise, the greatest commandments, particularly in the Gospel of Matthew, in which we're told that we are to love God and love others. But I think what's perhaps most important to know and remember about love, when it's talked about especially in the Bible, is that love is not only a feeling. It's not something that kind of warms us up in the inside, but that in Scripture, love is actually a verb. It's an action word. Love is just, a, more, is just as much about how we interact with others as it is about how we regard or feel about them. Love is more fully known in how we act, how we treat others, and how our actions impact them. So when Paul writes in that famous wedding passage of 1 Corinthians that love is patient and love is kind and it does not keep a record of wrongs, that it is not boastful and always forgiving, Paul is also teaching us that love is known and experienced in the ways we behave in relationships with others. So my reflection questions for you on the Advent theme of love, who has loved you really well? Who has loved you with patience and grace and compassion and kindness? What kind of impact has that had on your life and your understanding of who you are? Or how do you love others really well? How do you love them with patience and grace and compassion and kindness? Are there some you know who require an extra dose of some of those things? This morning, as we think about the light of Christ and the gospel of Jesus, that light that grows within us and around us, I invite you to spend a moment asking God to reflect, <clears throat> to expand our hearts of love, especially toward those we find it maybe most difficult to love. And finally, my favorite Advent theme, hope. My husband says most pastors have one sermon, and if I have only one, it's hope. In Romans chapter 5, we read, Endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Hope does not disappoint us. Now, I think it's important to be honest about the kind of hope we are talking about because we can hope in a lot of things and be disappointed. <laughs> you can hope that the Vikings win a Super Bowl and never have that hope realized. The hope we're talking about in Advent, in the book of Romans, and in the Christian faith is hope in Christ. It goes back to those words of Psalm 51, restore in me the joy of your salvation because all of our hope is in what God has done through Jesus Christ. That hope, the hope of the work of God in Christ Jesus, does not disappoint us. The hope we have in God never fails. I listened to an interview on the radio probably about a month ago with a man named Brian Stevenson. And Stevenson is an author and a lawyer and the director and founder of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Stevenson is the descendant of an enslaved man, and he told this story about his great-grandfather who had been enslaved. Now listen carefully for the words of hope in this brief story. These are the words of Brian Stevenson. My great-grandfather was enslaved in Caroline County, Virginia, and learned to read while enslaved. I never really thought about that until later, but I just started thinking about the kind of hope, the kind of vision it took to believe that one day you're going to be free, even when nothing around you indicates that freedom is likely for enslaved black people in Virginia in the 1850s. I have been thinking about that story ever since I heard it and the way that it so powerfully defines a particular kind of hope a defiant and embodied hope, a hope that has an ability to see and believe that the current reality is not the only reality, or even that God's hoped for reality, and then to live in a way that prepares one, that gets us ready for the hoped for reality yet to come. This, of course, is a perfect Advent theme. 
The season of Advent is all about preparation for the coming of Christ. And as the people of God, we believe that Christ has come, that Christ is with us, and that Christ will come again. Of all the Advent themes, hope is my favorite because it reminds me that this life, in all of its mess and glory, is not all there is. It reminds us that there is a fullness of the kingdom of God yet coming, one that we get a glimpse of on Christmas morning, but that we wait for even still, that we have a foretaste of now, but a fullness that we will yet know. And because our hope is in Christ, in his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his coming again, our hope does not disappoint. Hope in Christ never fails. Our hope is in him. For some of us, Advent and Christmas is all laughter and joy, probably especially those of us who are young. But for many of us, our celebrations over time also become tinged with sadness because there's grief at what has been no longer is. There are those who are missing around the table. Human life is messy and complicated and beautiful. And hope reminds us that there is a fullness, a redemption, a life yet coming in which everything is made new. And that all of the promises of Advent, peace and love and joy will all be realized in full. This is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the light of the glory of God that has shone in our hearts that we prepare to receive yet again on Christmas morning and the light that grows in us and around us in the season of Advent as we reflect on the promises of peace, love, joy, and hope. And so as you continue the end of your Advent journey, I have an invitation for you, a homework assignment, if you will. Take one of these themes, peace, love, joy, hope, and make it intentionally at the fore of your mind. Look for opportunities to practice it, to pray for it, to bless it upon others. Look for ways in which you experience hope, joy, peace, or love, or which you can share hope, peace, joy, and love with those around you. Look for every opportunity to grow the light of Christ in your own heart and to bear the light of Christ to others. In this season of preparation, may you be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit as we prepare to celebrate the birth of the one who has indeed come to set the captives free, to declare recovery of sight to the blind, to declare the year of the Lord's favor, to bring good news to the poor. That one has come, that one is with us, and that one is coming again. And because of who he is, we have love, joy, peace, and hope, and we have more than enough to share. May you be filled this Advent season with a great expectation for all that Christ has done and all that Christ will yet do. In the name of Christ, amen. Sorrow and fear, Emmanuel comes a seeing. 
His humble song is quiet and near, yet fills the earth with its ringing. Music to heal the broken soul, and hymns of loving kindness. The thunder of his anthems roll to shatter all hatred and blindness. In darkest night his coming shall be when all the world is despairing. A morning light shall quiet and free, so warm and gentle and caring. Then shall the mutes break forth in song, the lame shall leap in wonder, the weak blaze be above the strong, and weapons be broken asunder. Rejoice, rejoice, take heart in the night, the bright, the winter and chillest. The rising sun shall crown you with light, be strong and loving and fearless. Love be our song and love our prayer, and love our endless story. May God fill every day we share, and bring us at last into glory. Please stand as you are able as we confess our common Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In this season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. Holy God, renew your church and raise up leaders who announce your good news. Grant peace to congregations and seminarians in the midst of transition. Guide the work of candidacy and call committees. Bless our bishops, Elizabeth and Regina, and bless our ELCA partner congregations in Southeast Minnesota, South Sudan, Tanzania, and Colombia. And bless this congregation and all our ministries, and especially this week our care team who delivered 38 Christmas cheer packages yesterday. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Creating God, your spirit brought forth the earth and all that is in it. Breathe life into us that we are inspired to live in harmony with one another and with the planet. Bless our farmers and their families and all who depend on their bounty. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Shepherding God, you lead your people in paths of righteousness. Raise up prophets in our own day who warn against captivity to greed and point us to the freedom found in generosity. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. Nurturing God, you come near in times of worry and need. Cradle us in your arms that we trust you and are not afraid. Attend to any who are hungry, imprisoned, or ill this day. And especially, Lord, we ask for your care for all in our community, our congregation, and our families who suffer in any way. For Sandra Rower, Ron and Don Stone, Carol Alstead, Paul Morkin, Jerry Warden, Danella Griffin, Carmona Wiste, Lori Hagen Jensen, Judy Robley, Sue Alseth, Lucas A.J. Wiste, Mary Amundsen, Sharon Onstead Johnson, Rachel Krensky, Shirley Gerard, Sandra Wenig, Mavis Johnsrud, Betty Johnson, Anna Bingham Yiris, Sawyer Oaks, and Jennifer Wedman, 
For the family and friends of Audrey Ellingson, Dean Schudemeyer, and Marjorie Rosted, and for all those we name now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, receive our prayers. God of new life, you come among, among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you always. You may pass the peace safely amongst yourselves. Peace be with you. And you may be seated. Uh, just a reminder that um, the offering uh, buckets are in the corners at each of the doors. We give you such great thanks for the offering. You guys, sometimes uh, I don't think you realize the difference that what you give makes. The Christmas cheer packages that were delivered yesterday is just one example. But folks who are listening on the radio and Facebook, we tend to think of it as people we know, people in our own community. But this week, we got messages from people far away who depend on this broadcast, who love this broadcast. And so we give um, thanks to you for making that broadcast possible and for making worship possible. So thank you very, very much. Together we will recite the Canticle of Thanksgiving. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Great and wonderful are your deeds, O God of the universe. Just and true are your ways, O ruler of all the nations. Who can fail to honor you, Lord, and sing the glory of your name? Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. For you alone are the Holy One, and blessed is the one whose name is the Word of God. All praise and thanks to you, Holy God. Salvation belongs to our God and to Christ the Lamb forever and ever. Let us pray. God of our waiting and watching, we offer the gifts of our hearts and our lives to the service of all people. Prepare the way before us through, Jesus, through Christ Jesus, our pathway and our peace. Amen. And now gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, wherever we are, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear people of God, receive the blessing. The God of hope, fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is near. Thanks be to God. And now please stay seated and because this is very special. Mark um, Schrader uh, emailed me a while ago and said, we have a special piece that we want to do for the third Sunday of Advent. And he sent it to me, and I was like, yeah, let's do it. So... Golden Tate, Golden Tate, Christus est natus, ex Maria Virgin Egalente. Golden Tate, Golden Tate, Christus est natus, ex Maria Virgin Egalente. Peace, love, joy, and hope. Pick one or pick them all. 